but anyway, um, it's time, so I will start. Uh, thank you, everybody. I hope you can see the screen. Yeah. Uh, the green infrastructure, and uh, today um, we would um, mainly talk about the urban greens or uh, agricultural aspect of it. Uh, we initially planned a conference at the end of May, but unfortunately, uh, due to the coronavirus and everything, uh, it was postponed. And uh, but still, we would like to have some kind of a preparatory um, meeting. And um, today, with us are the presenters, uh, plus City of Nagoya and uh, Aichi Prefecture. We had. Uh, Finally, took time to join us. And, oops, sorry. Um, and with a, okay. and this is the schedule for. I think the screen is down. So this is the schedule that I sent to you. Um, and uh, Dr. Shimpo has she has to leave at two o'clock, so she would be the first presenter, followed by Marianne Penker uh, from Boku. And I think we shared her um, shared her slide. Uh, before when I send out this announcement. So I hope some of you had a chance to look at it. And then, oops. Um, topic today includes uh, urban agriculture, food, food and citizen um, participation, uh, which are related to green infrastructure. And uh, I don't think we will do this today, but uh, the ultimate overall goal was to come up with some kind of an indicator or scheme uh, for measuring these type of uh, green infrastructure. Yeah, so that was it. And the, yeah, it's, it's with the sponsors. We would like to thank very much for their support. We haven't used the fund yet, but uh, the future meeting will be funded by these foundations and uh, we had some grants as well. Okay, um, so um, thank you also for the invitation. I'm very excited about this opportunity to sharing um, uh, green infrastructure ideas across um, continents. Um, I'm not talking about Kleingarten, um, but a rather young phenomenon for Europe it's the community gardens, an idea coming more from the North American context and is different from the Kleingarten with its focus on community and collective action. So it's not individually used gardens, but usually it's collectively used gardens. And what we did is um, comparing Anglophone and German speaking countries. And I did this together with Ida Gödel. I'm happy to share some of um, these results. Um, so the, there is a huge dynamic in, in urban gardens and also a huge um, dynamic um, in community gardens. Um, Naomi Shimpo already told you that um, this is, um, that these gardens are um, popping up in, in many different cities in Europe. And there are a number of case studies, but what's really missing or what was missing was a transnational bigger end studies where a bigger number of gardens are compared to also understand this diversity of gardens and how they are organized as spaces of collective action in different geographic contexts. And um, we randomly selected community gardens in cities with more than 40,000 inhabitants. And our starting hypothesis was that there might be a big difference between English speaking countries like US, Canada, UK on the one side and German speaking countries like Germany, Austria, Switzerland on the other side. Um, this was also 
um, reason from our side by different legal systems uh, where we share the German speaking country share a similar legal system where we have um, a longer tradition of commonly used land, whereas in the Anglophone countries, the commons were cleared long ago and it's more an individual land use. So this was the starting hypothesis. Uh, we used websites, blogs, um, bylaws, articles, so everything what we found out there. We did not go in each of the individual gardens, so we missed probably a lot of interesting information that now Mishimpo might have collected when doing her case studies. So we did more um, desk research. Um, in terms of methods, um, it was a mixed methods approach. One was a cluster analysis, so more quantitatively oriented, and the other one was a qualitative analysis based on Ostrom um, design principles. And I briefly fill you in into um, Ostrom's design principles. She got in 2009 the Nobel Prize um, for her research on common goods um, and um, together with many colleagues and many cases all over the world where land um, is used or has been used collectively for centuries sometimes even, um, they developed design principles. So principles that explain why some of this collectively used land can, is, has been used so sustainably and so stable for so many years. Although there's this general idea if you have collectively used gardens, if you have common pool resources, um, that there is the problem of overuse. So this was her starting point and these design principles are our theoretical entry point. So apparently for commonly used land, it's very important to have clear boundaries, that there is a fence around it or a wall, or that there is at least clear who is allowed to harvest and who is not allowed to harvest. So clear membership rules, for example. Um, it should be a congruence of appropriation and provision. And Naomi Shimpo already referred to it, that in one of her gardens that she analyzed, um, there was possible that everyone harvested or took some of the harvest, even those not contributing the same amount of shares. So this somehow seems to contradict um, these design principles too, which says um, it should be a balance between how much you contribute and how much you benefit um, from this collectively used land. Um, the third principle is that those people managing the land um, should also have the right, the right to design rules so that they can co-decide um, what is done on their commonly used land. Fourth principle is effective monitoring by the community members themselves, so not someone outside is um, monitoring the rules, but um, the members themselves. Um, then also the members themselves decide about sanctions, and these sanctions should be graduated, so maybe starting with an early warning, um, talking to the people, and the most severe um, sanction usually is um, taking them the right to use the land, so um, excluding them from the land. The sixth principle is cheap and easy conflict resolution, because if there are many people, if they're collectively using land, they're usually um, also conflict, so it's important to come together and find solutions. Then it's also an issue of self-governance being recognized by higher level authorities, so it's important that the city, for example, um, is not too much intervening into these um, urban gardens, for example, but say, okay, you are the community, you are able to do your own rules, um, and we acknowledge your self-organization potential. And the eighth and last design principle um, is about more complex um, common goods, um, which usually have nested organizations. So we have individual local organizations that are um, working together in the national or in the city organizations. So it's more complex nested organizations that you also find sometimes. So these are the gardens we analyzed. Um, these were altogether 51 gardens in these six 
countries. Maybe if you look at the year, um, how old these gardens are, you already see that the oldest garden in our sample are from the US. Um, so this is also the place where this community garden ideas originated and came um, to Europe. Um, here we compare um, the two contexts and I only want to briefly point out two differences. I already mentioned the year of existence. So here we have um, the mean, so where is the German speaking area? Um, the average age of the garden is about seven years. In the English speaking areas, um, the average age of the garden is 20 years, so much older. And another difference is that um, in the um, English speaking um, cities, um, we tend to have wait lists, um, which we do not find as often in the German speaking areas. So apparently it's much more difficult to getting access to an English speaking garden than to German speaking gardens. Um, we identified three types of gardens. The first is the participation gardens. Um, here is an example from Brighton in England, um, and they have a big ad and they say, um, come to our garden, everyone is welcome, just arrive here on Wednesdays and Saturdays between 10 and 2 p.m., so no membership is needed, um, everyone is welcome. So this is an example of um, the participation garden. Um, in cluster two, these are closed garden groups, an example from New York. Um, there are literally walls around the garden, only those being members and paying fees have access to the garden. They need a key to enter the garden, um, so a quite different um, concept. And the third one is almost like a mixture of it. You see here a garden in Munich. Um, it's a garden, a garden with volunteer options. So they have two categories basically of members. So these are the um, uh, or two categories of participants. On the one side, members that are stable and, and contribute a lot of work and are involved in co-decision making. And on the other side, they have also the option for volunteers who um, participate only for short-term periods and are not involved in the governance, um, in the management of the garden and in the decision making. If we have a closer look um, at um, these um, three types, um, you see here on the left side the variables that um, fed into this cluster analysis. We look now to the first type, the participation garden, like the example from Brighton, where they invited everyone to participate. And the two out, uh, three outstanding features is that um, for this kind of garden to participate in gardening, you don't need a membership and most of the garden area is commonly used. Um, so um, people working literally on the same um, brush of tomatoes or potatoes and um, collectively gardening and using and harvesting um, the, the vegetables. And of course, this comes then with a um, that the garden group size is not fixed, so they don't even know how many participants they have because this is very fluctuating from one year to another and also from season to season. The second type is the closed garden um, groups. Um, this is very different in the sense that you need memberships, that there are um, mostly individual plots, um, that they have quite strict um, codified rules that are written down, um, that um, membership involves paying a fee, which is not the case for several of the other gardens, and that we have different smaller and bigger gardens, but anyway, it's clear how many members they have in their garden. The third type is this garden with volunteer option. Um, here um, we have um, the possibility to participate either as a member um, um, who has access to an individual plot or as a volunteer without membership. 
Um, they have individual plots and common areas consequently. And in this case, also very clear rules um, they have co-designed. Um, if we now look into the geographical distribution of these types of gardens, uh, we find the type one in the German speaking countries and in UK. So not in North America. So only in Europe, we find these very open participation gardens. Um, the other types um, we find in, um, in both continents and also in both um, language groups of countries. So this is a more mixed picture, but the type one we only find in Europe. Um, if we go back to the design principles, um, we would, um, from, from this analyze, analysis of the 51 gardens, we see a lot of accordance with Ostrom design principles. Um, so the design principle two to seven um, are fully um, fulfilled by all these community gardens. So this again um, supports that these design principles um, work in different contexts and also for community gardens. But we see um, a particular interesting um, result for the first design principles, which is clear physical and clear social boundaries. So having fences, walls, or membership rules. Um, and here, um, um, you've already heard this example from the Prinzessinnen Garden, um, maybe using this um, example, they don't have clear membership rules. Um, they are very open. And there, um, the idea is um, to have also broad community supporting this garden. Many of these gardens have unsecure um, land use rights. Um, so they have temporarily rights to use the land. There are even some of the gardens that are mobile gardens, so they can easily move the garden from one place to another place. So they very much depend on their neighborhoods. And if there is a bigger neighborhood supporting the garden, um, apparently this increases the likelihood that they can go on using the land. And this might explain that um, for community gardens, it can also make sense to have open membership and a huge community um, supporting um, the area. Um, also the European context, um, the focus of the garden is more social cultural and also sustainability is an issue, whereas in North American country, um, cities, the focus is more on individual food production, um, uh, individual recreation, in Europe, um, we have um, the sustainability issue and also um, um, coming together, integrating different ethnic groups. Um, so this, these are topics um, that we see rather in Europe um, than in North America. And in terms of types of organization, we also see a big variety. Um, in Europe, many decentrally autonomous collective choice units. So they by themselves decide Whereas in North America, um, many of the individual garden groups are part of a bigger um, organization by the city or even national, um, like the American Community Garden Association. So this is a um, multi-level governance um, that we see here. So coming to the conclusions, um, we did not see a difference between English and German language countries, or not so much, but rather a difference between European and North American um, countries or cities. Um, so the English, um, British um, garden, community gardens are more similar to the German ones and then um, to the US or Canadian ones. And there are differences that the European ones are much younger, the gardens are younger, that they are much more open, um, so that um, it's, for them it's more important to involve a lot of people from the neighborhood, a big diversity of, of um, people, different ethnic groups, age groups, um, or different social backgrounds, and that collectivity is more important in Europe than in North America. So for example, having more plots that are used collectively 
um, and more activities um, for um, cooking together, um, um, party together, and so on, which is not um, the case in the older, um, more mature and more professionally, you might also say, organized North American gardens. Um, I also have the same conclusion I already said, like um, Naomi Shinto, um, there is no blueprint. We have really a huge variety of, of gardens out there and how they are organized. We have open and closed boundaries, um, more important membership rules and gardens that don't need membership rules, um, gardens that have clear rules how much everyone could harvest um, and others who have no rules on, on how much um, um, you are allowed to harvest and work nevertheless. Uh, we have self-organized, decentrally organized gardens and um, nested organizations in big national um, um, umbrella organizations, so huge, huge varieties in terms of organization. Yeah, um, indicators was not um, the, the focus of our research, so here I'm only guessing, and this is um, really um, nothing coming out from our empirical research. But if I would have to propose indicators for green infrastructure, also coming from these um, collective um, community gardens, um, I could think of two um, indicators where it might also be easy to get the data for. One is the number or the share of collectively organized um, green infrastructure. So comparing, for example, the individual used allotment garden to this more collectively organized community gardens. Um, this could be an indicator. Another indicator, um, even more general, is the share of urban population with access um, to urban farming, to gardens, um, which might also be very different um, from city to city, from country to country. And with these ideas, I would like to conclude. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marianne, and thank you for your suggestion for the even for the indicators. Um, that's uh, quite helpful for prepare uh, for us to prepare for the uh, international workshop. Are there comments, Stefan? Um, yeah, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, also, in in context with Shimpo San's presentation before yours, it's it's. Uh, yeah, fascinating to see how many different um, approaches there are, how many different systems apparently work on the ground, and uh, that you, you have the conclusion that there is no blueprint. And um, coming from this sustainability implementation background, um, where you need, in order to, to have these, these um, approaches, these gardens persist over time, um, there, there is this question, is, is there some kind of recipe? Are there key elements that you could name and suggest to people who are maybe interested in, in uh, promoting such, such gardening um, approaches? Um, and, and so you, you, would there be anything that, that uh, or, or for example, would, would it be possible to measure how long a particular garden gardening um, system persists over time. You, you had these figures where you said um, how many years the, the gardens had been active prior to, I think, 2017. Mm. And were there any, any patterns in these, these temporal aspects? Mm. I'm asking in particular because um, with the, the Japanese situation where with aging society and, and uh, ever fewer numbers of young people, that when you go to places where these activities are carried out, that often you have this, this notion that we don't really know for how long we can continue this because the ones who are uh, supporting or maintaining the activities are getting on an age and there are not enough people, uh, younger people, taking over. Do you have any, any impression from your study whether there's, there's anything that could decide how effectively you can draw young people into these schemes? Mm. 
Yeah, I think this is a very um, interesting um, question. Um, we were wondering ourselves um, that the difference between North American and European um, cities could be attributed to age um, of the organization um, because um, um, it seems that the North American um, gardens are have stricter rules, much clearer rules. Um, they are um, part of bigger organizations. So um, it seems they are ma more mature. They have um, um, more professional organizations um, in the background. So the question, what's interesting for us um, to observe in the next years is if in Europe, the gardens um, will move also to these more professionally looking organizations, um, or if they would disappear, um, those gardens um, that have very no rules, um, even being proud, we don't need rules, um, everything is self organized. Um, so maybe this is only because it's a very new phenomenon in, in some of um, the German speaking. Um, cities. Um, in terms of age, um, comparing, which was not part of our analysis, but if we would have compared allotment gardens and community gardens, um, there is a huge um, age difference. So the allotment gardens are um, kind of an outdated model or seen as an outdated model. Um, it's, um, they are organized um, with organizations, but everyone has his or her own plots and um, there is not much collective action in terms of collective gardening. And it seems that the community gardens are particularly attractive um, to the younger generation because um, it's so much about social interaction, it's so much about um, partying, about learning, about um, sustainability. And um, it's also less um, responsibility in terms that you become a member and then you have to commit financially and also long-term, um, particularly those gardens that have this volunteer option or that are open for everyone. Um, it's a very low threshold for participation. So you just go there, do some gardening, and you leave and you don't have any responsibilities. So this seems to be very attractive to young people. Um, thinking, for example, again, of this precession and garden, um, this is very much driven um, by um, students, um, by the younger generation, and they actually invest a lot of commitment and time, um, but nevertheless, it's, it's very, flexible, many of them moving from one city to the other city. So it's if you come to a new city, um, this is really actually a good opportunity to meet other people um, going to community garden and being involved in collective um, activities. Um, so you um, get to know your neighbors. Um, and this seems to be attractive in the European context. So I absolutely do not know about the Japanese um, context. So probably Naomi Shinpo um, can rather refer to these age issues and in Japan where I'm absolutely ignorant. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, the security of the gardens, I mean, how, how long they can exist is very important issue. And regarding the Japanese case, uh, it is, there is a possibility to make committee gardens on farmland and the farmland is very secure to land use so in that case uh, people cannot develop the land very easily so it's secured relatively uh, comparing to other lands built lands mm -hmm. but the problem is uh, it was really uh, restricti restricted uh, i mean you couldn't build anything on farmlands or you cannot sell farmers easily or uh, other than landowners, people cannot cultivate, cultivate, uh, couldn't, couldn't cultivate. But now that uh, regulation is changing and it's getting more flexible and urban people can rent some farmlands and do some farming instead of the landowners. So it's changing and I think community gardens will get popular uh, in such secured land use. 
Thank you. Um, so Shinpo san has to go, and I, I think also Soga san from University of Tokyo, you have to go around 2.30. Um, I, I will leave at 2.30. Oh, you leave 2.30? Uh, Soga san, I'm sorry, you, you said you just want to listen, but if you have any comments before you go, uh, yeah, or if not, that's okay. <laughs> Well, maybe. Can I float uh, questions? Yeah, to, uh, yeah, please. To Miss uh, yep. uh, uh, Mariende? Miss Mariende? Yeah. Yes. Uh, from uh, IG Prefecture. Yes, uh, thank you very much for a very uh, interesting presentation. And uh, but when we think about the situation, in Japan, the most uh, critical uh, critical uh, gay problem could, could be the uh, how to uh, save the land for the uh, so such uh, youths of, for agriculture in urban area. So, or could you ask me ask you uh, how the such uh, gardening land are provided? Who provide uh, such area for uh, gar gardening? And also, or uh, I'd like to ask uh, about uh, how the uh, urban planning recognizes such usage of the land. So two questions from me. Mm, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a um, really critical question. How to get access to land. Land in urban areas um, is very expensive. Um, so um, very few um, garden groups own the land. Um, in the most cases, so talking now about the European context, which is different from the North American context, but in the European context, um, um, it's often public land um, or it's land that is being developed and where the city planning administrations um, um, argue if you want to develop this land you have to provide a certain share of land for at least temporary loose use uh, for community gardens so um, if um, there are new city development areas um, um, used usually for example also in Vienna you see um, um, building construction site and next to these construction sites you see community gardens um, so this is considered as building the neighborhood and the community even before um, all the people have moved into the area. Um, this means for the community garden organizations that they have access to land, but usually this land is only temporarily provided. So they get it for five years, sometimes 10 years. And then, of course, they try to mobilize the neighborhood to extend um, the lease contract. Um, and um, sometimes they are successful of um, extending the lease contract. Um, and if not, they usually get access um, to another um, piece of land close by. So if their land is being developed, um, they can move and have to move um, their garden to another place. Um, so also here um, there is a lot of discussion how um, sustainable can this be in the long run if um, the um, access rights to land are only temporarily. Um, some of the gardens, as I already mentioned, they have mobile gardens, so they work with containers and can easily move then the containers from one place to another place. So this is um, kind of a workaround or solution that community gardens um, come up with. Um, but of course, they would be happy um, to have um, permanent um, land use rights, 
which we do not have in the at least in the German speaking context. I'm less sure here about um, um, Great Britain, UK. Um, on the other hand, these um, from from a more social science perspective, um, these temporarily um, used land also brings in some flexibility in moving gardens from one place to another place um, and um, also creates opportunities for um, new people entering the group if the garden moves from one place to another place. Um, looking for example the American gardens, they often have um, land either uh, in the form of a trust um, or um, collectively uh, private land um, owned or owned by a group. Um, there you also um, see very exclusive groups, um, so they don't allow new members to enter. Um, so this could also be an effect if um, the ownership um, is very stable and long term. Um, so I think um, you can also see at least some advantages of temporary um, um, use of land with all the challenges that come for it and with all the fights the garden groups um, are fighting um, to extend um, the, the contracts um, for a longer time. Okay, thank you, Marianne, and uh, thank you, Kisma-san, from IG I, Prefecture for the... Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, yes, uh, temporary farming is a very, very interesting idea. I have not ever think, I have okay. never ever thought of. Thank you. So, the title of my presentation is the Sustainable Green Space Management for the Urban Periphery Areas based on the evaluation of the uh, two indicators. The one is the uh, landscape management cost and the second is the utilization or accessibility to the urban agricultural field. And uh, the introduction is this uh, point, a PowerPoint, as you know, uh, in Japan, the population shrinkage and ending society is um, atten attention, paid attention. And on the other, other hand, the concept of a compact city is gathering attention for urban sustainability in the urban planning field. As you see, the uh, population induction areas were set inside of the urbanization promotion area, so the uh, uh, each municipality assumed that their uh, population will uh, gathering uh, near nearby the uh, it nearby the uh, more more, it, it more suitable areas, and however, there is insufficient discussion about how to manage the outside of population induction areas. For example, there are many vacant rot and unmanaged agricultural fields, and how to uh, continue the well environmental situation is a very, very big issue in this country. And this is uh, the model of the urbanization, or as you see, the Professor Simpo said the uh, Ebenezer Howard shows the, this diagram. The, the, this diagram shows the center and zoning model. And in urbanization period, the city expands from the center to the outside and the consuming the agricultural land and which consuming the agricultural land and nature. On the other hand, in the shrinking period, the Right side, in the lights, as you see the right side, the diagram we proposed by the Sin Aiba in Shito Daigaku University, uh, Shito Tokyo University, and he proposed the four and the layer model. And then he said that the unoccupied houses and vacant road do not necessarily occur in the fringe area, and the city has 
entity or spongy entity will be spawned in a wide area. So how to manage the um, change of the land use, such as agricultural field and uh, urban uh, city areas and uh, other land use is a, how the management is a very important in the urban shrinking period. And on the other hand, as many professors say, um, the ecosystem services by urban agriculture, of urban agriculture is paid attention. The crucial role of urban agriculture is widely considered having positive implications for health and providing a complete set of ecosystem services in cities. As you see, the production of food and preservation of biodiversity, the curation of CO2 and environmental protection, and also disaster prevention and the recreational value, as Professor Ida said, it, uh, the urban agriculture had many, had many functions. So how to preserve the function, it, how to preserve or more improve the function is a main topic of this shrinking age. And uh, this photo shows the uh, people enjoyed and have a, uh, have a fun in the urban agricultural field. The uh, right photo is uh, my children and they, uh, they really enjoyed the uh, doing their uh, agriculture activities and they enjoy their food and the other um, simple sites uh, there the relaxation and the eco and environmental education is a very important topic in the uh, urban urban citizens too so and the other point is the innovation of society around agriculture and farmland. The telework is paid attention, especially in the, this Corona-19 situation, and uh, increased time spent living at home and in the surrounding cities caused the increased demand and increase of demand and dependence of favorable living environment. And especially the Improving the quality, uh, in order to improving improve the quality of life, the urban greenery is very uh, is paid attention to. Urban farmland can play a role such as responding to recreational demand through public farms and handling farms, and providing a new farming business as side business. One of the greenery that accepts new ways of working and living. And uh, so the background of the urban agriculture is like this. And in my research, um, we focus it on uh, we focus on two indicators. The first indicator is the management of labor forces, and the second is the accessibility of variable uh, various special groups. And uh, so so that. This diagram, uh, this graph shows how to match how to match the labor forces and the accessibility of various social groups. And uh, in the and as you know, there are many variations of urban agriculture, such as community gardens, seminole and um, urban agriculture parks. And the distribution of the parks is very different and. Uh, is different and 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 so and each type of urban agriculture has different management labor cost. And on the other hand, there are many types of um, social groups such as younger people, younger generation, parents with small children, and elderly people. And different social groups have different preferences or accessibility to urban farms. So how to match the social group's demand and accessibility and preference and farmland owners' management intention and management labor cost? 
In other words, labor forces in each type of urban agriculture is a crucial issue for sustainable management of urban agriculture. So uh, this is my um, case study site. Um, as you see, this site is Kitanagoya City, located in the northern area of Nagoya City. And this is um, uh, urban peri periphery areas in the Nagoya metropolitan areas. And as you see, the uh, green area is a productive green. So there are many productive green zones in the Kitanagoya city. And um, so how to manage the productive green is the main topic in, in this city. And also uh, the new a new urban agricultural park is planned in the southern area in the city. So, how many people is showing have have uh, have interest in joining the agricultural activity is very important in this city. So, the first indicator, landscape management labor count, is um, like this. The indicators is for the Evaluation of the amount of the amount and densities of labor forces. How annual labor? Uh, how people work on each uh, green type is the uh, indicator. So annual labor account uh, and the density is the evaluation index, and we and um, we calculated the landscape management labor forces of each landscape types in Kitanagoya city. And the, there are many different kind of uh, urban, uh, uh, green spaces in urban areas. And as you see, the farmland such as other crop field or orchard have the most highest value in the landscape management. So, and and we also had the questionnaire survey last year about uh, the farmer's intention to cancel or continue the designation of the uh, productive grain. And this is the result, the first result. And as you see, the 27% owners uh, want to continue the farmland. And on the other hand, 80% want to finish or can cancel the de designation of productive grain area. And on the other hand, um, we focus it on the accessibility analysis. The second indicator is the social group accessibility to urban agriculture. And the indicator is the proximity indicator. Um, this is uh, proposed by and my collaborative researchers and in Italy and me, and the proximity indicators uh, calculate the uh, number of people at fixed distances from each green spaces and weight them with the squared inverse of the distance from green spaces. And uh, this is a uh, very uh, uh, we are now cal calculating the accessibility in the Kitanagoya city. And uh, this is the first result of the questionnaire survey of the Kitanagoya city's citizens. And the result shows the accessibility to urban agriculture field. And they said 80% are want to, 80% of people want to go to the agri urban agriculture field within one kilometer to five kilometers. And, and they said, and the uh, purpose of joining the activities is the good ex exercise or reflex, refresh or relax. And uh, I'm sorry, this is uh, very um, under construction and I am now calculating the result. So um, next step, the, we focus it we, we will focus on the spatial analysis for matching the demand and supply of the urban agriculture from the, from the aspect of management labor forces and accessibility of each social groups. So, um, and uh, 
thank you very much for listening to my presentation and more details of our, our research is uh, written in the, this book, Labor Forces and Landscape Management in Japanese Case Studies. And if you uh, have interest in the labor forces analysis, please um, uh, ask me and I, I will uh, give you some materials for the uh, for the index indicator and thank you very much for the uh, your listening and okay this is my presentation thank you thank you very much um, fun, uh, uh, a very interesting uh, example from uh, uh, north of Nagoya from Aichi and uh, professor Takatori um, used to work with us uh, she was promoted and she's now in Kyushu. So a big <laughs> loss for us, but um, yeah, thank you for joining. Um, any comments or questions? So um, her work is uh, quantifying the labor that would take to maintain certain landscape or uh, agricultural lands, basically. Yes. And uh, it, quite interesting to see um, the preferences on the one to five kilometer range. Uh, I, I, I once uh, heard when I was uh, talking in Tokyo that also people want uh, their farming lands um, with a distance that they can go with a bicycle. So I think this also is a similar range. Um, with a different expression. I would like to really thank all of you for the, the presentation and, and uh, com uh, comments, valuable inputs. Um, Marianne-san and Takatori-sensei has um, also presented some um, initial ideas or indicators they have used. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm not sure whether these would be um, how usable or um, for the uh, local governments or for the prefectural governments, uh, that this it, it's a little bit too difficult to do it online. So we would like to do that when we meet face to face. But um, for IT prefecture and um, city of Nagoya, uh, it would be um, quite useful for us if we can get a feedback later on, not today. Um, what kind of uh, measurement you would think could be useful for your uh, measuring your policies and so on. So that's something I would like to um, discuss in future. Ano, sorry, a bit in Japanese. Ano, ma, workshop wo shoulai teki niya ano, taimen de kaisai sashi te tada ite ano, kano de areba, eto, sono. 今回のような都市緑地とかあの都市のえっとグリーンフラーみたいなところを測っていくあの指標みたいなものとしてどんなものがあってでえっと行政の方にとってはどんなものがえまあ有効有効というか実際に政策の中に組み込んでいったり計画
こがあの,のこう意識のギャップみたいなものが、えー、分かると面白いかなと思いますけど、というのが一つ、えー、ありました。でそれから、まあ、もう一つ面白かったのは、あの井田さんの方で、そのフラッドミチゲーションについてのこうギャップみたいなものが、こう意識のギャップみたいなものが。まあ、すごくあったんじゃないかっていうような話があって、うん、何かこう、そうですね、す,すぐ直ちに、こう、制度的にできるという話ではないのかもしれないんですけれども、うん、まあ、行政が行う啓発みたいな、えー、要素で、えー、まあ、どこまで、はいなんですかね、あの取り上げるべきテーマの一つが見えたのかなというふうに思いました。はい、ありがとうございました。また次回のですね、あのインパーソンの、えー、ワークショップを楽しみにしています。Thank you.、Uh, so just briefly, I'll translate the points that it was quite interesting to see that there is a、um, contrast with the willingness to continue the farming in, in Nerima, in Tokyo metropolitan area, and、uh, in north of Nagoya. That、um, the people in the very urban area of Tokyo are willing to continue the farmings. This may have to do a little bit with the scarcity, maybe, but、um, the contrast between the two、um, cities was quite interesting. The other thing was what Professor Ida has mentioned that this gap of、uh, these owners of the land owner,、um, owners of the land aren't so aware of the mitigation. Uh, function of the flooding, and that's something that the,、uh, the governments may play a role. And also, a different、uh, awareness about the, those who have the land and those who haven't the land. So, that's something new. And、uh, I think Professor Ida has given us a, a link where this、um, willingness in the farmers of the farmers in Nerima Prefecture, they have 83.2%. Are willing to continue or willing to、uh, keep the urban agricultural lands. So, thank you very much.、Um, Mori san, comment on what the Miska? Mori san, eh, eh, Mori san, hi. はいえー、とすみません、えー、と森ですけども、えーまあ、今日は、えー、お誘いいただきましてありがとうございました。であのーまあ、なかなかあのいろんなヒントをいただいたとは思うんですけども、えーまあ、名古屋市としても、えー、生物多様性の大切さというのを今後伝えていかないといけないんですけども、えーまあ、そういう時に、あのーまあ、コミュニティガーデンというのは非常にいい切り口だなというふうには思いました。あのーまあ、コミュニティガーデンというとなかなかあの新しい話ではないとは思うんですけども、えーまあ、ただあの話を聞いてると、えーまあ、生物多様性の話だけではなくてえー、例えば、えー、防災の話ですとか、えー、あとまあ高齢化社会の話とかいう話も、えー、そういうのにもまあ貢献できるのかなと、えー、あと、まああのーまあ、先生を、まあ、発表された先生の中の方でですね、えーまあ、コロナウイルスでもまあ機能農園が機能しているよって話もあったので、まあえー、こういうあのコミュニティガーデンの可能性っていうのが非常にあるのだなということで、えー、ちょっとそういう切り口が非常に大切だということが気づかせてくれました。Thank you. So he, 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 he mentioned that he, there was a, quite a、um, bit of a food for thought, and、uh, in making the, the importance of、uh, biodiversity, these approaches in green areas could be quite useful, instrumental, and also the,、um, I think,、uh, approaches for、um, these. Preventing the disasters, that these are some of the points that he could take, take, a, it's a take away, take home message, lessons that he, he learned from these meetings. So that was, in a nutshell, what kind of a responses we had.、Um, unfortunately, we're running kind of out of time. So I, I, I think we will close now、uh, officially. Uh, but um, um, thank you very much、uh, for your time and efforts that you brought together. And I really hope that、uh, 
we will be able to meet in person very soon. Um, uh, sorry, about, I, no, go ahead, yeah. Can I ask her a quick question to Dr. Pinker and then Dr. Stefan? Can I, um, very uh, quick questions. Yeah, then, go ahead, go ahead. Thank you. Um, related to the Morrison's uh, comments, I'm very interested in it's what's going on in Austria, Austria now about the community gardens under this uh, COVID-19 pandemic situations. Does it working well or are they closing? Oh, it's a good question. I have arrived here only um, not even two weeks ago, so I'm not I actually I don't know um, how it's going on. But um, um, as we are allowed to um, leave our homes um, for more than two weeks now, um, I assume that the community gardens work um, like before uh, with some social distancing. Um, so families are allowed to garden together, um, but they have to keep a distance of one and a half meter from um, neighboring families. Um, but um, what we have heard, um, the landscape planning colleagues, professors here have been very active because the government shut it down the um, public gardens um, mm -hmm. um, because of concern of, of COVID-19 spread. Um, and there was huge protest because of social um, exclusion because the rich they have the gardens and the poor they need the public spaces um, so government reopened um, the parks um, um, very fast again um, to avoid um, social unbalanced um, measures and to ensure that also those without private um, green spaces can benefit from the health um, benefits of um, public green, because um, also in terms of immune system, um, public green is very important. I see. Thank you very much. And then another question to Dr. Stefan. Um, you living in Tokyo or in Japan for a long time, so you know very well um, about the situation of urban agriculture in Tokyo and other cities. And then my question is about like organic products. The European countries, their urban farming is um, very organic, I think. I visited several cities, but they cultivate the um, vegetables um, organically. But uh, um, in Japan, it's very different, as you know. Maybe the, the paddy field that you visited is organic because it's not for sale. But uh, there are many professional urban farmers and they use the, the chemicals because they have to sell their products. So, but the, the trend in the world is the urban farming should be organic. So I'm very wondering how we can shift the situations, the Japanese situations, um, about the organic products matters. Do, do you have any idea or do you have any, what, what do you think about this situation? Yeah, no, I, I um, was, was made aware of these differences and uh, I, I recently talked to people who were based at the, the Policy Research Institute for the Ministry of Agriculture uh, here in, in Tokyo. And uh, there, there are a few colleagues who actually focus on, on urban agriculture and uh, they, they said that, A, it's not easy for them when they go because they are the Policy Research Institute, they're not really the ministry. Um, and that when they talk to the, the people who are more involved in the policy development, um, that it's, it's not easy to get across the, the urban agriculture idea uh, or the organic agriculture idea. And uh, that, I guess, in, in the political context, it is, is interesting mm -hmm. to, to see that um, the demand for, for organically produced uh, agricultural products is apparently not as high as in European countries or in North America oh. and the question why and uh, I, I have no no answer um, and well part part of my my interest in now also getting in, involved in these uh, studies looking at, at urban agriculture is partly this this educational aspect and um, if we look at sustainability as a, a holistic concept that um, whatever we use, we, we need to make sure that the way it is produced does not 
cause trouble elsewhere, even though it might be far away from where we live. And uh, yeah, so that, that I, 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 I'm wondering and I would hope that it would be possible by extending these, these um, agricultural, uh, these, these urban agricultural uh, approaches that um, people might become, consumers might become more aware of, of that it matters what they choose when they, even if they, they can't source most of their food from a local farmer, that um, even if they have to go to the supermarket, that they would make an effort and, and try to, to buy organically produced vegetables or fruit. Um, but yeah, that's, that's for me currently a very theoretical concept and, and I, I don't really know how, um, like there obviously are, are labels but um, labeling is, is also a difficult issue in, in, in European countries, like from my own experience as a consumer walking through German supermarkets, that um, it's, it's not easy to um, really figure out what effect choosing a particular product has. And um, that, yeah, I, my, my, my hope is that if we can get a, a closer link between research activities, science communication, and and uh, yeah, the the supply chain for for all the the different uh, businesses that we use on a daily basis, that it might be possible to have a a more informative, more reliable, more transparent uh, scheme of of labeling what product has which effect um, outside my immediate personal realm. And I mean, obviously, um, health aspects might be one, one thing where people might be, be, um, if they believe that, um, eating organically produced, uh, agricultural products is better for them personally, um, that that is one, one motive, but, um, that, that not many, not, not that many people might be driven by that. I might think, well, there, I don't see proof that that is a big difference. And so conventionally produced, stuff is fine by me, um, that if you can then add further aspects, like um, especially the biodiversity aspect, obviously, if, if that could be communicated more um, effectively, that then consumer behavior might change. And so, um, um, yeah, so that's, that's... Jump on. Um, we are also, we have done three years, we are doing three years uh, project with the the CSR Ken, the Institute of the Institute you just visited in, we looked at the European uh, Japanese comparison. So, uh, so I, I, I don't have a, an answer myself, but um, I, I think that there are lots of um, open questions and that, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's um, very worthwhile to, to pursue these lines of research and close collaboration with, with colleagues in administration and in business. We can, we can share the, some of the materials of the, about this conventional and um, organic um, agriculture uh, effects on biodiversity and climate, which is actually a German report, I think, from uh, an institute. But um, there is also a, a market in Nagoya where they sell every Saturday the organic um, and organic food, and also newly uh, only those farmers who have newly joined the farming practices. So that's often referred to as a one example of a uh, trial to enhance uh, organic food. But you're right, uh, it's very difficult to um, get it very popular in Japan, which I think we, we had a long discussion with Marianne as well. But uh, um, I think this is an interesting topic, but we need another, probably a session for this. And uh, I thank you everybody for the active participation. Um, and uh, I hope uh, we will be able to organize face-to-face -face meeting in sometime this fall or winter, uh, which all, all of you, uh, I hope would uh, send you an invitation. Of course, you, you have your schedules and this, we never know what's going to happen, but uh, <laughs> we'll at least try. Um, for for the for the face-to-face -face meeting, I just want everybody to think about what could be a good indicator 
for, in, for the question you have or for the measuring these type of um, activities in the urban settings. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for your time and input and contribution. And, uh, Thank I'll you. I'll see you in the, in the, uh, in the materials later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.